I want to introduce um, Greg Treverton. Greg is the professor of uh, the practice of international relations and spatial sciences at the University of Southern California. And I uh, was the former chairman of the National Intelligence Council. He returns now for a discussion on actually uh, some of his experiences in Latin America around the economic and political environment in which he was uh, involved in. So over to you, Greg. Thanks, AJ. It's a great pleasure to be here, particularly on, on this day. <laughs> uh, back in the days when there was trilateral cooperation, trilateral meetings between the US, Europe, and Japan, it was always hard to know hmm. how to start a talk hmm. uh, because Americans always start with a joke. Europeans never do, because if you do, you're not serious, and the Japanese start with an apology. Uh, so I began a practice which I'm following today, and that is uh, starting with a joke and apologizing. Uh, the apology is because I'm going to uh, start a talk on Mexico and Central America with a German joke. The one thing I perhaps share with, probably the only thing I share with Mark Twain, is that we both struggled our entire lives with German. Mm. Uh, Twain said famously that he didn't understand inf infinity until he realized it was a chance for some of us to learn German. <laughs> okay. <laughs> my uh, the structure of my talk follows the uh, German joke about the friends who go to a movie, huh? uh, movie in German. They're uh, into the movie and one of them turns to the other and says, uh, this is pretty boring. Let's leave. And the other one says, no, I think I'll wait for the verb. <laughs> well, in this case, there's going to be a theme to this talk, but it'll come uh, closer to the end. I first uh, had the, the privilege of encountering Mexico in the late 1960s mm -hmm. when I was an intern for IBM in Mexico. Uh, if for the people in New York, it was, a, I suppose, a high-minded effort to uh, introduce an interesting young man, perhaps, to uh, the private sector and to IBM. When I got to Mexico, I was just a body. So they asked me what I wanted to do. I said, well, I'm interested in economics. So uh, they said, well, why don't you work for the strategic planner? Well, he was a terrific guy, a jovial Central European, if that's not an oxymoron, mm -hmm. uh, but had a really great sense of humor. Uh, he was about to become an American citizen. But that was gonna be his fifth like lifetime citizenship. This is a Central American, Central European story you can imagine. Uh -huh. uh, his wife, by contrast, was very solidly and stolidly Swiss. Uh -huh. And she kept saying she wasn't going to change her nationality every time she changed her shirt. <laughs> well, I, I um, had learned that uh, Mexicans are very nice people. Uh, but I also had learned that part of their politeness is if asked a question, it's very impolite, they consider, to say, I don't know. Hmm. Uh, this made asking for directions in the street, long before cell phones and GPS, a little perilous. You had to ask several times and uh, then triangulate. <laughs> Uh, it also um, uh, made asking other people in the company for data to do our planning a little perilous. The company mm. was growing like uh, Topsy, and I got all these numbers. I uh -huh. spent my days at an old-fashioned adding machine, manipulating <laughs> name numbers, most of which were pretty meaningless. I'd gotten numbers because people were too polite to say, gosh, we don't have that. <laughs> uh, so I got these numbers. Well, one day, uh, my boss and I were due to report to the board, uh -huh. uh, and we're standing outside the boardroom, and... Uh, before I could stop him, he knocks on, on the door with a shave and a haircut, two bits. Well, unfortunately, uh, that means something very different in Mexico. Um, for those of you who don't swear a lot in Spanish, it's roughly, F your mother, dumb ass. <laughs> so we just okay. say when we opened the door, uh, our Mexican colleagues were falling out of their chairs <laughs> laughing. It was a wonderful moment. Well, I used to uh, stop across the street from my, my office is on Platforma. I used to stop across the street mm -hmm. at the Hilton to read uh, English and American magazines. Well, one time when I was doing that, I overheard a conversation between two uh, American women. Mm -hmm. One of them said, uh, uh, I had a terrible experience, or what could have been a terrible experience this morning, but it turned out to be great. It turned out to be nice. She said, I was stopped by a policeman, and he said I'd done something wrong. I wasn't entirely sure what I'd done, but he said, no problem. Uh, he was so nice. He said, no problem. Um, you don't have to go downtown to pay the fine. You can just pay me and I'll take care of it. Well, that made me think that <laughs> cross-cultural miscommunication isn't always a bad thing. Uh, sometimes it pays. In this case, it literally paid for the policeman. Well, fast forward. I'm edging toward a theme here. Uh -huh. uh, fast forward to, to uh, NAFTA and what we now call USMCA. It's interesting, we changed acronyms from one what sounds like something you'd spray bugs with to another one that's unpronounceable. And if you tried, would uh, uh, sound like a, 
a sinus affliction, perhaps. <laughs> um, but I think NAFTA was a, a very big deal for Mexico, a bigger deal for them than for us. Mm -hmm. uh, it really recommend, represented, I think, a kind of change in strategy. Uh, you know the famous quote from Porfirio Diaz, the famous Mexican soldier and president. He said, uh, pity the poor Mexicans, so far from God and so close to the United States. Well, with NAFTA, I think the Mexicans decided that if they couldn't get closer to God and further from the United States, they would uh, do their best to benefit from mm. the presence of their rich neighbor. Mm. The uh, people in Mexico, many of the people in Mexico who oppose NAFTA, uh, like my friend, former corn, foreign minister Jorge Castaneda, mm. uh, did so because they wanted more. They really wanted something more like the European Union, where in effect the richer northern states mm. subsidize the poorer southern ones. And in this case, it would have been Mexico, Canada and the United States uh, providing structural adjustment funds to, uh, to Mexico. Well, that didn't happen, but still I think uh, uh, Mexico NAFTA has to be considered a success. It did over time triple the trade among the three countries. And interestingly, it did have the effect over time of stemming migration. Remember in the late 1990s, there were huge waves of Mexicans, mostly men, mostly workers coming north, uh, for the last few years, while the numbers have ticked up yeah. recently, in the last few years, there's been out migration, more Mexicans leaving the United States than coming here. Well, I knew that uh, uh, this there had been a big change. Uh, one last anecdote about Mexico. Mm -hmm. I was at a conference in Mexico City in the early 2000s, and I came across uh, uh, Mexico's best political scientist and a senior Mexican diplomat having a conversation over coffee, just the two of them, in English. Uh, I said, this wouldn't have happened 20 years before. 20 years before, right. the Mexican elite was um, looked toward Europe, was kind of faintly uh, condescending toward the United States. Mm -hmm. Now, Central America. I first uh, got to know Central <laughs> America on a fact-finding visit uh, in, in, the war, in the war days, the 1980s, the Contra Wars. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a fascinating trip. It was a group of, uh, of people from Boston, included the author, Doris Kearns Goodwin, her husband, Dick Goodwin, who uh, I subpoenaed when I was working for the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, but <laughs> no hard feelings. And Howard Simons, a legendary character who was editor of the Washington Post, who was uh, dying at the time, unfortunately, but mm. didn't, didn't spoil a sense of humor. He could say mm. things like, uh, at least I don't have to worry about sunscreen at the beach this summer, right? <laughs> All right. Well, we, uh, <clears throat> we were led, no, not, not exactly led, we were organized by two uh, young political advance guys from Boston. They were really steeped in Boston politics. It was easy to imagine them basically passing out $5 bill, bills to would-be voters, right? They didn't speak Spanish, but they uh, didn't take no for an answer. Mm. So uh, one day we found ourselves leaving a nature hike mm -hmm. uh, and uh, went straight into Oscar Arias's, the Nobel Prize winner and president living room on a Sunday morning. So, <laughs> Yeah, they'd managed to just not say no. We also spent a fascinating afternoon <clears throat> with the Sandinistas who had commandeered this country club in, uh, in, in, in Managua. Uh -huh. uh, and it was interesting. I, I, I hadn't yet moved to California, but uh, Daniel Ortega, who was now then and yeah. later president, uh, struck me as sort of a prototypical Berkeley graduate student. Hmm. Uh, aviator sunglasses, leather jacket, sort of radical chic. Uh, <laughs> Jeans. I couldn't quite take him seriously. The only person among the Sandinistas that I would have liked to have a drink with was their elder statesman, Tomas Gorge. Uh, um, but it was a, it was a fascinating time. Huh. Um, well, now to the uh, now to the verb or the theme. <laughs> with NAFTA, uh, we the United States recognized not entirely consciously, I think, and not not too explicitly. Mm -hmm. But that Mexico was essentially part of our strategic space. It was, it was, it was us. Mm -hmm. And now it seems to me we need to recognize that so is Central America. Hmm. Central America's problems aren't at the border. Central America's challenge is in Central America. Uh, and it seems to me we've got to recognize that it's part of our strategic space and behave accordingly. Jacques uh, began with Cinco de Mayo. Yeah, I think most Americans think Cinco de Mayo commemorates something about Dos Equis, but uh, <laughs> as he said, it was an important event in Mexican history. Right. It also may have been an important event in, in American history because it was 1862, mm -hmm. and there is a school of thought among historians that if the French had easily won, they might have turned northward and joined up with the Confederacy. 
Oh. So it may, it may well be that in addition to saving themselves for at least a while, yeah. the French eventually won, that the, <clears throat> that the Mexicans saved us. And it seems to me we ought to repay the favor by getting serious about a North American wow. federation. Interesting. Interesting, Greg. Um, so, Greg, if you, uh, I have a few questions, um, if you don't mind. No. So, um, you brought up kind of this interesting concept where, in fact, if, um, and, and this is entirely speculative, but um, how would you see as kind of, you know, the Central American, Mexico, U.S., and Canada operating differently on the world stage? And in fact, we had developed a stronger economic bloc, you know, across those regions. Well, I think no doubt the United States would still be the most important. Though mm-hmm. Canada is is a, is a big economy in its own right. Mexico is is growing, though it yeah. has its share of problems. Uh, I, I think it would be it would be more for me. I think an, an economic and social unit than a, a, a different political actor mm-hmm. in, in international politics. It would make some difference, but the real goal is to make things enough better in Central America so people don't have to leave. So they, they right. so they don't hmm. want to leave, or in many cases, really have to leave for fear of their lives. Uh, so the more we can do, and I, uh, this administration has started, uh, resumed, I should say, uh, some assistance to those countries. And I think that's really important, particularly the, the Northern Triangle countries that are in, in the worst shape. That's El Salvador, Guatemala, oh, mm-hmm. and Honduras. Hmm. Um, so that beginning to think about that on site uh, rather than at the border is the right way to think. Interesting, about. interesting. Do you think that, in fact, um, we might envision a world where, in fact, there are... Um, uh, a kind of a stronger economic set of incentives that would allow both Canada and the U.S. perhaps to support the economies and you know the, the growth of jobs, uh, perhaps more uh, politically stable uh, uh, governments in those countries. Well, I think that's surely the right direction. It's it's notable that hmm. you know the uh, European Union, for instance, Europeans know that the stream of migrants is going to continue. Now, yeah. A lot of them came came out of the wars in the Middle East, but even if the wars die down there's still going to be a steady stream of migration. And one way they need to think about how to, how to, how to at least regulate it in some ways is probably something like NAFTA, where they make uh, hmm. some kind of agreement with the big, at least North African uh, states. A lot of people are going to come from Sub-Saharan Africa as yeah. well. But from the big Northern African states, I think something like a, a, a Mediterranean NAFTA would make a good deal of sense. They're pretty far from that at the, at the moment. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, that seems to me the, the right direction. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Uh, fascinating uh, story in history. I mean, when I guess in terms of, you know, back in the day, interacting with the Sandinistas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was quite something. It was. Uh, <laughs> uh, you, uh, did, did you ever feel you were kind of fearful for your, your own security in life <laughs> down there? <laughs> well, when, when they, we, there was this, uh, artillery fire when we were uh-huh. in Salvador. <laughs> uh, and that was never, never fun. You never like hearing guns going off, right? <laughs> or you'd like to be far enough away until you say, what was that, right? <laughs> <laughs> but this was, this was not that. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I've, uh, I've felt fearful a couple of times in my life. But, uh-huh. uh, only on, on that trip, only in El Salvador. <laughs> in El Salvador. So if we have any, if we have any budding um, uh, diplomats amongst our audience, do you have advice about if, if you're, if you're, going to go into a conversation, discussion, even negotiation with um, either you know, any of the countries in Central America or, or Mexico, would you start with an apology or a joke or, or neither? <laughs> I think I might start with an apology. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, would, that would show that you were uh, properly trying to be at their yeah. level. Right? You weren't going to lord it over them. You weren't going to act like you were the big, powerful <laughs> representative of uh, the United States. And would you do it in Spanish or English? <laughs> uh, better be doing Spanish. That always okay. helps. Yeah, yeah, people, that makes a big difference. Yeah. It's interesting about languages where certain languages are structured so that the verb is at the end. Yeah. I don't know if folks on this audience actually know, you know that, that reference to the German language. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm going to wait for the verb. Yeah, yes. Exactly. <laughs> That's very German. Fantastic. Well, well, thank you, Greg. That was uh, fascinating. And at the end of at the end of the town hall, if, you know, we'll open it up to questions if Great. we have time. Okay. Thank you so much. Greg. Thank you.